Okay, I'd like to introduce, Abby is an author, a scientist, an educator, and a public speaker. Her book, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, Why Evolution Explains the Human Body and Intelligent Design Does Not, became a number one bestseller on Amazon in the category of theism. With a doctorate in zoology from Oxford University, you've heard her on NPR's Here and Now telling us about the unintelligent design of the human body. Among her other works, she recently contributed to the book Women Versus Religion, The Case Against Faith. She's currently a professor of human anatomy and psych physiology at, at Curry College in Massachusetts. You, you come a long way. Okay. Let's, let's welcome Dr. Haber, please. Can everybody hear me? Hear me too well, I guess. I'm here to defend science. As the people assembled here know, when used properly, modern science has given us a length and quality of life that our ancestors could only imagine as heaven. But denying science is popular these days. Take the case of Roy Moore. Roy is a creationist who denies evolution. He ran for the U.S. Senate in Alabama last year and came within a few points of winning. He didn't lose because he's a creationist. He lost because he's a child molester. When a creationist bid for the U.S. Senate fails only because he is also a child molester, we clearly have a long way to go. And and a few years ago, I realized what a big part of the problem is. The problem for us scientists is that the whole creationism and intelligent design controversy is not a scientific controversy at all, but a political one. In fact, creationism and intelligent design are nothing more than handbooks full of untrue but convenient political talking points that are being used in order to bring down science and science education for religious reasons. The promoters of creationism and intelligent design want to get their hooks into what's taught in public schools so that they can indoctrinate the entire United States against science on the taxpayer's dime. Creationism was invented for this political purpose. Then, in 1987, creationism was declared to be religion by the United States Supreme Court. Then, by total coincidence, intelligent design was discovered by these same religious political pressure groups the minute, the very minute, that the Supreme Court said that creationism is religion. You got that? In 1987, creationism was declared to be religion, so it couldn't be taught in public schools. And then, in 1987, creationism's promoters magically discovered intelligent design! It's a miracle! So, intelligent design is simply a strategic rebranding of creationism for political purposes. But, Intelligent design's promoters like to say that the human body is so perfect that it must have been designed, and by an infallible designer at that. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. But first, understanding that this is a political issue goes a long way towards explaining why intelligent design has gotten as far as it has. It's because scientists keep approaching it as though it were a scientific issue. So we make <laughs> observations, do experiments, and write our papers, showing repeatedly that all the evidence is in favor of evolution and nothing but evolution. Then we publish our papers in scientific journals, where they are read by other scientists. I think you see the problem here. Unfortunately, <laughs> 
Most people don't read scientific journals, and they never will. This is why we have libraries full of evidence for evolution, and most people don't know it. So doing more research won't make a difference. What will make a difference is treating this as the political issue that it really is. And political arguments are different. Political arguments must be short, easy to understand, memorable, and preferably entertaining. And call me old fashioned, but I want my political arguments to be true as well. Once I realized this, I started looking for new approaches. And inspiration finally hit me in the middle of an anatomy and physiology lecture when I was lecturing about reproductive systems. And this is why my first argument against intelligent design in the human body is the male testicle. I realized that this was just the sort of thing I needed for a political style argument because once I started talking about men's testicles, people would pay attention. So without further ado, here are the problems with men's testicles. The testicles hang outside the body in a sack of skin called the scrotum. Why? Oh, okay. Why? Because human body temperature is too hot for sperm production. Think about it. Having normal body temperature be too hot for sperm production is bad design. So the testicles have to hang outside the body in the scrotum. Uh, should I turn off this other mic or something? Okay, hang on. Is this working? Yeah. I will just do this. And let's see how this goes. Okay. I realized that this was just the sort of thing I needed for a political style argument because once I started talking about men's testicles, people would pay attention. So without further ado, here are the problems with men's testicles. The testicles hang outside the body in a sack of skin called the scrotum. Why? Because human body temperature is too hot for sperm production. Having normal body temperature be too hot for sperm production is bad design. So the testicles have to hang outside the body in the scrotum, thereby putting a vulnerable organ in a vulnerable place. Putting a valuable and vulnerable organ in such a vulnerable location is bad design. Men are put to all sorts of inconvenience and risk severe pain and worse because of this unfortunate positioning. One would think that God could do better. So the testicles, with their inability to be warm and productive at the same time, hang outside while all our abdominal organs are safely tucked up inside out of harm's way. Our cold-blooded relatives don't have this problem, and their sperm-making equipment is safely inside them. If you don't believe me, try to find the balls on a frog. You won't manage it unless you do a dissection. That's because a frog's testicles are safe inside him where a vulnerable organ ought to be. Does this mean that the so-called creator likes frogs better than men? Or does it mean that as certain mammals evolved, the ones who had their balls hanging outside reproduced better? You decide. This brings me to my primary reason for why evolution explains the human body so much better than intelligent design does. It's this. The standards for evolution are much lower. The standard for systems that evolve is good enough to not cause death before reproduction too much of the time. The standard for intelligent design is designed by an infallible creator. You can see the difference. Believe me, as an anatomy and physiology professor, evolution explains human anatomy far better than any notion of a good designer. Human bodies are just too badly put together to stand up to even reasonable design specifications, much less infallible ones. 
But let's get back to testicles. I hear you wondering, but what if warm body temperature and sperm production just can't go together? What if warm-blooded animals really have to have their balls on the outside? Well, then tell that to elephants. And armadillos, sloths, hyraxes, echidnas, platypuses, seals, whales, dolphins, manatees, and rhinoceroses, all of whom have internal testes and warm body temperatures. They are all mammals, just like us. So the creator gave great big elephants and rhinoceroses protection for their testicles, but didn't give it to the much smaller and more vulnerable human men. Does that seem fair? Then there is the matter of convertibles, which are not just for cars. You'd think that the designer would try to give us humans who were made in his image the best deal that he could manage, wouldn't you? But he didn't. Some warm-blooded animals have testicles that hang outside for reproductive purposes, but that can be pulled up inside the body out of harm's way for protection. Actually, lots of mammals get this deal. For instance, rats, mice, rabbits, hares, cavies, and guinea pigs can all do this. So when they want to breed, the testicles can hang outside and stay cool. But when they're not breeding, they can be pulled up inside for safekeeping. Think of the convenience. Many human men would kill for this option. First off, men could control their fertility easily. They could pull their testicles in most of the time, which would keep them safe and prevent unintended pregnancies. No guesswork, no rhythm method, no trips to the drugstore, and no surgeries. But when they wanted to breed, they could pull their testicles out for a few days, make some fresh sperm, and human sperm are made every day, by the way, and then be ready to breed when they want and not when they don't want. Rabbits got this deal. Rats got this deal. So who does the designer like better? Mice? or men. Then there's the matter of birds. Birds are warm-blooded too. In fact, they have higher body temperatures than we do. But like frogs and elephants, their testicles are safely tucked up inside them. If you don't believe me, try to find the balls on your Thanksgiving turkey. You won't manage it unless you do a dissection long before it gets to the supermarket. Once again, a male bird's testicles are safe inside him where a vulnerable organ ought to be. So, does the designer like birds better than us? Or did God make birds in his image? In other words, is the designer a turkey? So you've just heard some pretty useful information. If you go up to a member of your school board or state legislature and say the following, if we're so intelligently designed, then why do men's testicles hang on the outside while an elephant's testicles are on the inside? If you say that, I guarantee you that that legislator will actually stop talking for a few seconds. And you will have your opening. Use it. Or when a member of the state legislature or a member of your school board says, I think we ought to teach intelligent design or creationism or teach the controversy, you know what you can say? You can say balls and then back it up with facts. So I want everybody to know this testicle argument. I want the testicle argument to be a part of popular culture. This means that I want musical comedies with dancing testicles. I want cartoons on YouTube about testicles. I want movies about testicles. I want them on murals, postcards, neckties, samplers, tattoos, and stained glass windows. And you can help. But to do so, you need, you need to take on board another hard truth. 
for a political argument to work, you have to make it. You have to say it out loud. You have to step outside your comfort zone and make that argument out loud when it matters. And I'm here to help. We can all practice this now. I've brought along a little something to help you out with this. Hang on. I've, I've got a little prompt here for you. Can everybody read this? So, when someone in your state legislature says, I think that intelligent design should be taught in public school science classes, you can say, balls. Say it with me now, you're doing great. Balls. So, when someone on your school board says, creationism is just as scientific as evolution, you can say, balls. When someone running for office says, I think we should teach the controversy, you can say, balls. What do we say? Balls. What do we say? Balls. What do we say? Balls. I think you've got it. Now let me wrap this up. So there you have it. I've given you one simple example of how the human body is badly designed. I could have talked about hundreds. If I had looked at the rest of nature, I could have talked about thousands. But now I want to talk about beauty. I want to point out that the human body is actually wonderful. It's just that it's wonderful in the weird, crazy way that evolved systems are wonderful, rather than being wonderful in the careful, mathematical way that design systems are. There's real beauty here, but not design. I think that our bodies are beautiful the way they are, regardless of their imperfections. But I also think that there is real beauty in our ability to think, do research, and really understand the world we live in, rather than just making up stories. This capacity allows us to understand atoms and molecules that we can't even see, and principles we can't see that allow airplanes to fly, Electrons we can't see that light up electric light bulbs. And yes, evolution, which often takes eons to occur, so no one human being can see it working, but we understand it and we can make successful predictions based on it. So we know it's there. Intelligent design does not make predictions. Evolutionary theory does. The evolution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria can only be understood by evolutionary theory. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are now killing people we used to be able to cure. I fear having public health officials who don't believe in evolution. Ecology, which is the interplay between different plants and animals and their environments, can only be understood if you understand evolution. I fear having environmental policy made by people who don't believe in evolution. I realize that in making my presentation to this audience, I am preaching to the choir. But there are times when this is exactly the right thing to do. Remember, this is a political argument. I've just given you some talking points that you can use. In fact, my main hope for this talk today is that I've given you, the choir, some great new songs to sing. Thank you.